praise the Lord. Psalms 150 verse 6. Let every breath that has praise, that let every thing that has breath praise the Lord. And praising the Lord indeed we have done. Um, I stand here under the permission of Pastor Jackie, Pastor George, and Miss Jackie. Thank you for this opportunity. And with that, let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for giving each and every one of us the opportunity to get here today. As I stand here before everybody, O oh Lord, use me as your vessel and let me let me pass on the word to each and everybody here. We ask you to let everybody have a receiving heart and take home whatever they will take home. Be it positive, O oh Lord. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. What is the most difficult era in human life? Infancy, adolescence, mature adulthood, old age. It probably depends upon where you stand or where you are right now. Many might suggest that it must be one sunset years, but I beg to differ. I think the hardest point in life is in one's youth, because that is where one's character is either made or broken. That is where everybody has their defining moment in their life. In the scriptures, Genesis 8.21, Moses says, the imagination of a man's heart is evil from his youth. In, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, Timothy says, flee youthful lusts. As you can see, youth is like the two different sides of a coin. You have the positives and you have the negatives. Now it's, it's all up to you. Well, probably not necessarily up to you alone. You have people around you who can either build you or break you. Those are your models, role models, or vices. That, that truly is what takes people through the journey we call life. Solomon, who wasted much of his life in folly, perhaps thought better of the matter in his declining days. He contended. Ecclesiastes 12.1 Remember now your creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and years draw near when you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Again, Paul would say in Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, Let no man despise your youth, but you be an example to them that believe in the word, in manner of life, in love, in faith, and in purity. You see, back in the olden days, you'd find people, youth, people my age, younger than me, being given great opportunities to become kings. They start their priest, priestly journeys from a young age. Yesterday night, I was watching a football game. It was really disappointing when my team drew against some really small team. But nonetheless, you'd see majority of the players on the pitch are really, really young people. You wouldn't find a 50-year-old man chasing after a 22-year-old uh, youngster, per se. Like, they're not of that age anymore. You wouldn't find old people competing with young people. These teams, they give opportunities to the youth to make a stand for themselves. They believe in their young people. Whereas you find in countries like ours, children are to be seen and not heard, which I believe is not right because if you don't give a person in their youth an opportunity to speak for themselves, who will they speak to? Perhaps it's something within them that they really need to share, something that has been troubling them. But you don't give them that listening ear. It ends up, they end up not having an answer for their questions. Have you helped them? No, you haven't. What have you done? Instead, you have broken a character. Let's look at some of the people in the Bible who were given really, really big opportunities and responsibilities at a young age. First of all, we have Joseph. I'm sure all of you are very familiar with the story of Joseph, a young man given uh, really, really big abilities by God. He was able to foretell the future via dreams. And what did his brothers see in him? They had envy for him, passionate envy, not just the type of envy where you see 
your friend with new clothing item and you're like, mm, I wish it was mine. No, theirs was passionate to the core. And what made it worse is when their father exalted him and yet he was one of the youngest. What happened to him? They sold him to Ishmaelite who took him to Egypt and he was bought by Potiphar. In Egypt, he had a test where Potiphar's wife followed him and tried to seduce him. In Genesis 39, verse 9, Joseph counters, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? There you see, he's, he's already been through a lot. I'm pretty sure at that point in time, most of us would have already given up. You know, Potiphar's wife comes, or maybe let's say Potiphar himself comes, he'd be like, ah, whatever happens, let it happen. But what did Joseph do? He stood firm in his faith and his belief. Later on, as his story subsis sub subsequently, subsequently sorry, unfolds, we learn that Joseph was being used by God as a providential instrument for the preservation of the Hebrew nation. Joseph would later recognize in Genesis chapter 45, verse 5, God did send me here to preserve life. Given the opportunity, Joseph took it and he ran with it. He didn't put it under the couch. He didn't sweep it under the carpet. No, he kept it in his heart, went through thick and thin, and later he did what he was supposed to do. Miriam. Who is Miriam? Miriam. Anybody? Yes. Moses' sister, right? What did she do? Or rather, we all know after a while, the, the Hebrews in Egypt were multiplying, and they became more and more until the Pharaoh became scared of their presence in Egypt. And what did he decide to do? To kill the boy child, right? Joseph, uh, sorry, Moses' mother took it upon herself to save her son. She built a small raft out of uh, vines and tar, put it on the river Nile and put her baby within it. Who did she send to look after the raft? Miriam. Miriam. Let's say Miriam ignored what her mother told her and Moses drowned or wasn't found by the princess, or rather he was found by soldiers. Would the Bible then fold out the way it did? No, it wouldn't, because somebody ignored the responsibility. The whole weight of the Hebrew nation depended on that one girl doing her duty. Had she not done it, who knows what would have happened. I'm pretty sure God would have found a way and saved the Hebrews, but it wouldn't have been the same as it is right now, right? Uh, okay. Here's my point. The entire future of the Hebrew nation was entrusted to a young girl. Does this say something about how God values the youth? Surely it does. How many of you take your time to sit down with a child and ask them, their views about a particular topic. I'm pretty sure most of you don't. You just, he's a child, what does he know? I'm pretty sure if you sit down with some of these young faces right now and talk to them, you will be amazed at what they know. Small bodies, big minds. <laughs> David, the story of David who became Israel's king is quite familiar to all of us, right? David was disdained a mere youth, initially by King Saul himself, his kinsmen, and then by Goliath. First Samuel chapter 17, verse 33 and 42. Never mind, God was with this young lad, focused on him, and victory was granted as a turning point for the nation of Israel. Once again, the future of a whole nation depended on one person. Not an adult, but a child. What confidence God had placed in a spiritual lad who
had focused on him as well. You know, David had used most of his time, he was hiding sheep, but on the side, not on the side, it was his main focus that he would praise God, exalt him, write Psalms while he was doing what he was supposed to do. And in the end, God exalted him for what he did. Killing a giant. Metaphorically speaking, even we right now face our own giants, be it at work, at school, your day-to-day -day life, that bully in school, the boss at work, the mountain load of paperwork you need to do in the office, that pesky neighbor, and the neighbor who's always in your business, and yet their own houses are like, yeah. <laughs> Why? You know, life can't be life if it's always smooth. Sometimes we need to face our own giants. We need to appreciate everything that God puts in our ways because take a glass, for example. A glass is beautiful the way it is, but for it to be the way it is, it has to pass through fire. Okay? First of all, it starts out as soil. Then it passes through fire. Then it becomes the beautiful piece you buy for thousands of shillings and put in your house. Now, all of us, of the soil. God puts these giants in our lives and we have to pass through them to become who we are meant to be. Another story is the story of Jeremiah. I may be biased here, forgive me for that. The, weep, the great weeping prophet, what did he say when God called unto him? I'm just a child right? And what did God do? God touched his lip and told him, I will be with you wherever you go. Okay? He sought so desperately to bring rebellious Judah back into conformity with the law of God. It is possible that his preaching career started while he was a young teen and he called off the Lord he, he, he was called of the Lord to be his prophet to the wicked nation. God can use a youth of faith. Probably during Jeremiah's time, there were men, learned men, who could have easily have taken up the task. But what glory to God would there have been if somebody who is steadfast in the faith goes and preaches, whereas in this situation he takes a child and uses him to do his work. I mean, which one would bring more glory to the Lord? Obviously the child. And even me standing here today, it wasn't easy to be honest. But with the grace of God, we'll make it through this summer, don't worry. Um, Jesus Christ himself, although most of you may think that he started his ministry at the age of 32, what did he do in the temple when he was only at the age of 12? He was teaching, right? As a teen, apparently, Jesus learned his stepfather's trade, which was carpentry, and must have worked as a carpenter too because that was what he was sometimes referred to as. Jesus was only 12 at the time he was sitting in the temple, Luke chapter 2, verse 47. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. At this age, he was old enough to speak in the temple, since the Jews believed that was the age of responsibility. Jesus realized at the age of 14 just how, just that he had a mission and just who he truly was. After that, his whole life was focused upon the ways and means of executing his mission according to the will of his Father in heaven that of publicly, publicly proclaiming the, go the good news of man's sonship with God and salvation by faith. As a parent, sometimes I'm sure, okay, I'm not sure because I'm not a parent, but on assumption here, if you sit down or if you just quietly observe your children throughout the day, I'm sure at one point or another you'll be amazed at like, 
is that really my child? Maybe it's something good. Maybe sometimes it's a bit too cheeky. But nonetheless, at some point in the day, you will have that moment. You know? And at that moment is when you really realize that Okay, yeah. Something needs to be done. If they're a bit too cheeky, spare the road and spoil the child. But on the other hand, if they really amaze you in a positive way, why don't you encourage them? Some of you will just sit there in silence and just brush the moment away. But if you really take time and nurture what you've seen you never know where it will take them or you as a matter of fact right sometimes you can even use the naughty side to your advantage or their advantage you know if they're really good liars take them to acting school you know it can help right benefits your wallet and gives them a standing of their own If they're the ones who, when you want to chopper them, they run, wow, you'd think they're bold. <laughs> Take them to a running track, you know, build that talent. But then, you know, sometimes you really need to see a child going through some hardship for you to really know their character. Just like an adult. You know, they say, money changes people, but I don't think money changes people. Money just brings out who you really are. And that's the same thing I say about a hard situation. It doesn't change people, it just shows your real character. Right? What I think one should be doing is try and maintain your specific character throughout. Don't, 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 be, a, don't be a wolf in sheep's clothing. You know, when we're in public, you're the angel. In private, you're the devil himself. You know? <sighs> I'm pretty sure everybody in this sermon, in this service right now, has a backstory. Something that has made them get to where they are today. And I'm pretty sure most of it started in your youth. And once again, that just comes to echo out my point. Characters are either made or broken in one's youth. Right? Uh, <sighs> Jesus Christ himself one, he was sitting under a tree. A group of children were running towards him. And what did the disciples do? They tried to stop them. And what was Jesus' reply? Let the children come to me. What does that show? He knows the value of children. Because children are the future of your nation tomorrow. You sit amongst adults and share the word with them, but you leave the children to waste. Do you think your nation tomorrow will be as good as it is today? No. You see? With role models and examples on television, take for example the political situation that we've had over the past few months. As a teenager or youth, seeing what is happening, what makes you think that I won't take it upon myself, possibly, to right the wrongs I'm seeing? And since people won't listen to me, where will I result taking my anger to? My neighbor. If nobody listens to me, I will make you listen to me. And you might not like how I will make you listen to me. Maybe violent, and it may have and it may end up hurting a lot of people. And all you could have done to stop it is just take a moment, sit down, and listen.
these children you see here, they may be young, but they probably have stories of their own. Most of you may not know what they have gone through. You may know. I don't know. But I challenge all of you today. Pick a child from here, sit down, and speak to them. Listen. Don't apply the rule that children are to be seen and not heard. They are to be heard, you know? I know this is, we've all been brought up knowing that a child isn't supposed to speak. You speak once you're of a certain age. But we need to start speaking for ourselves. And that goes to all of you as well. Don't just sit down, stay quiet when you're hurting. Speak. Somebody can help you if you speak as well, you know? God says, ask and it shall be given to you. If you look for that audience, it will be given to you. Okay? Take it upon yourselves to help the children. I know it may sound like I'm being biased as a child, but, you know, I'm just standing out for my peers. And even you as adults, you, okay, you also need to know where to put a stop to the speaking. <laughs> it may reach a point where Fine, they're speaking, but even you guys, don't be rude. There's no way in the Bible where you found anybody who's rude prospering, right? Once again, we go back to the story of David. In his family, how many brothers did he have? This is to you adults. How many brothers did he have? Seven. And he was the youngest. Right? Out of all his brothers, why couldn't God pick any of the first six and pick him? That was a miracle in progress. God can use the smallest of us all and change to a whole nation. Jesus Christ, he died at a young age. Okay, he didn't die, but he was crucified at a young age. While most of the people in the Old Testament lived to a ripe old age. But because of man's sin, God decided to cut that short. Sometimes I think we need to have the mind of a child. I'm pretty sure most of you wish you were children at some point in your lives, right? Like you could go back and become a child, less responsibilities, you know. I'm not looking forward to becoming an adult, to be honest. <laughs> Taxes, no. Responsibilities, not too many, you know. If I were to be asked, I, would, I, would, I wouldn't mind staying a child forever. But at some point, we have to grow up, you know. But sometimes you just, as adults, I, I, I tend to think that most of you often overthink situations. While sometimes all it takes is just the mind of a child to get through a situation. Right? Try doing a crossword puzzle with a child. You'll see how they'll get through it easily. But then you'll sit there for hours and hours, even giving a speech. Simplicity is key, and that's where the mind of a child comes into play. Children, humility, OK? Most adults tend to be quite proud of what they have achieved, but the children copy what their parents portray. 
A child is basically a copy of their parents. If you are proud, look at your child. They will be proud. If you are rude, look at your child. They will be rude. But if you are kind, compassionate, friendly, that's what your child will be. As parents, I think you should be role models, first and foremost, to your children. You have to show them what you would like others to see. You know, it's like those situations where a parent lets their children to be too free. Then when you go out in public, what happens? They embarrass you. I'm pretty sure that's not something everyone would like to go through, right? Then when you get at home, you're like, ah, this child of mine. Don't blame the child. It's your fault. If you took a moment and reflect upon your own character, change begins with you. Once you change, your child will see that you have changed and will change too. Don't expect to take your children to school and you're like, ah, this child, stubborn, taught at school, waste of money. No. At home, what do you show your child? You get called to school because of indiscipline cases. And I'm pretty sure if you start saying what you did as a child, your child is probably better off than you are. So if you expect your child to be kind, compassionate, basically portraying all the fruits of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, humility, and self-control, ask yourself, do you show them yourself? Consider, cons, a consideration of these cases and others that, may, that might be noted clearly show that youngsters, properly trained, are capable of courageous faith and considerable usefulness to heaven's cause. Perhaps we do not realize how we might influence youngsters to serve the Lord. Do we not overlook their potential all too often? Do we? Think about these cases. Christ has put these children in each and every one of your lives for a reason. You know, nothing is accidental. Everything happens for a reason. These children are here to help you, and you are here to help them. As I said before, offer a listening ear. Talk to them, listen to them, understand and understand them. And believe me, you will be amazed at what they have to say. My sermon was brief, because I believe it's about the quality not the quantity. Amen. And with that, I'd like to call either Pastor Jackie or Miss Jackie to take over from here. Can we praise the Lord for that wonderful song? A better praise. Thank you, Jeremiah. We celebrate you, and we, you'll agree with me that the Lord has spoken to the young, to the not so old, to everyone here. I'm not sure I would want to water anything that he said. Just go reflect upon everything that has come forth from that child. It was truly the voice of God speaking. We know the dilemma of being young or being a youth. You're considered foolish. At the same time, 
you expect her to be an adult. Think of the times you're just a child, what do you know? Next minute, behave like a grown-up. So this identity crisis that the youth find themselves in, the young, who propagates it? Sometimes we don't know better as adults. And that is why, as we were told earlier during the moderation, the, 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 the prayers, that let the will of God be done. We should always consult God for his will. The Holy Spirit will teach us. I believe those who have children know that it takes the hand of God to raise the kind of child that is godly, whose character you can be proud of. The young people sitting here, thank you, Emma, for listening, and Sifa, thank you. The young people sitting here, I hope you heard everything that has been said. Don't be afraid. Don't sit down with your troubles. Ask for an audience and you shall get it. Never fear repercussions. As a teacher, I'll tell you this, the most stupid question is a question that is never asked. Because then you die wondering what could have been the response. And for the adults, adults to children, adults to adults, active listening is a very scarce commodity among humans. Sometimes we pretend that we are listening, yet we are waiting for, as a person is speaking, we are already thinking of a response. It means we were not listening. The way we've been taught to listen to God during prayer, so that we don't go talking and talking, and we end up missing on what God is saying. So should we, so in the same way, we should also learn to listen to our children. As a person who works with children very closely, from two years old to 18, I can identify with what Jeremiah has just said. So as adults, it's a conscious decision every day to remember that these people have a voice. Sometimes we are too busy, sometimes we are too dismissive, sometimes we are focused on other things. But I can tell you that there's a wealth of knowledge, a wealth of creativity, a wealth of things in the minds of the children. Allow them, of course, within parameters. And I like the way he said, learn where to put a stop. And the examples of you give them too much freedom, then when you need them to behave in a certain way, that character that you've allowed to build embarrasses you out there. So again, it is not leaning on our own understanding. It is leaning on God's guidance. Because God is the one that has brought this wonderful human being into your life. Whether it's biological, whether it's adopted, whether it's you know guardianship, whatever. As long as there's a child under your charge, trust in God. Books are helpful. Everything is helpful, but always trust in God for guidance.